I want to get you to this morning to take your Bibles out. We're going to go to a verse of scripture found in 1 Samuel chapter 16. You, you've heard this story, I'm sure, many times. 1 Samuel chapter 16. Chapter 16. I've been preaching uh, on the anointing. I started last week on the anointing. And I, I, wanna, I, I felt like that God wasn't finished, and I wanted to just kind of press into that just a few minutes longer uh, this morning. Can we do that? First Samuel chapter 16. Um, when you're there, say amen. amen. Let's read. First Samuel chapter. Y'all, y'all know God's doing some stuff, right? Yes. You know, the Lord, I, was tell, I told y'all this the first of the year. Don and I were talking about it again yesterday. That, um, that, you know, I hear all these slogans and things of what God is, what 2022 is going to be like, a new you. And t- anyway, um, but I just, this is what I even told my leadership. I said, I just feel that God's going to do something special. This, this is, this year's going to be a, God's going to do something special. Something special. In this church in your life because you know you are the church right this is just a building that God has blessed us with you're the church he's going to do something special in you amen let's read 1 Samuel chapter 16 and the Lord said unto Samuel how long will you mourn for Saul seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel let me just tell you a little bit about what's going on right there Saul, God had anointed Saul to be king. There was an anointing on his life to be king. And God had called him to be king. But Saul had proved to be disobedient to God. Disobedience is as the sin of witchcraft. God will not tolerate disobedience. Never think you're going to walk in the blessing of God in disobedience to God. You know, uh, anyway. So God had rejected Saul. He said, I, he said, I'm sorry that I made Saul king of Israel. Now watch what he says. And the Lord said unto Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from, from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go, and I will send thee to Jesse, the Bethlehemite. For I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, because Saul was still alive, if Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And then call Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint unto me him whom I name unto you. And Samuel did that which the Lord had spoke and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town, they trembled at his coming and said, do you come peaceably? And he said, I come peaceably. I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. Now sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he, sac- and he sanctified Jesse and his sons, and he called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass that they, as they were come, that he looked on Elab. He looked on Elab, one of, one of uh, Jesse's sons. He looked on Elab, and he said, surely the Lord's anointed stands before me. But the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance or on his height, on his statue, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not, and listen to this, for the Lord seeth not as a man sees, for the Lord looks on the, for man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Mm-hmm. The Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and, and made him to pass before Samuel. Can you see this little runway show? These sons are past one of them. Yeah, yeah let, let, let this one. And he called him and he made him to pass before Samuel. And he said, neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shammah to pass before. And he said, neither hath the Lord chosen this. 
Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, the Lord hath not chosen any of these. <laughs> and Samuel said unto Jesse, Are this, is this all of your sons? Is there, is there any more? And I'm sure that he thought, well, yeah. But then he said, and Samuel said unto Jesse, all your children here. And he said, there there remains one, but yet the youngest and behold, he keeps sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, send and fetch him for we will not sit down until he comes here. And he sent and he brought him in. Now he was ruddy. (laughs) And with all of a beautiful countenance, ladies, anyway. (laughs) And godly to look on. Mm, Boy, I tell you what. David was a stud. (laughs) He looked good. And the Lord said, arise and anoint him. For this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of all and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that very, from that day forward. Father, I thank you today for your word. I thank you, God, that we are gathered in this place. Now, Lord, would you just give me clarity of thinking? And Lord, would you anoint every word that comes out of these lips of clay? Use them, Lord. Anoint ears and hearts and minds that, Lord, lives will be changed. We'll make sure you get all the praise and all the glory for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, lay your Bible in your lap and give the Lord one more hand clap of praise. I think we left off last week with saying that Jesus was the anointed one. Jesus was the anointed one. And we read from Luke 18 last week. And I think that's the way I ended it, Luke 18, where he said, Jesus is saying, and he's identifying because he knows that they expect it. Because understand, last week we started talking about the anointing. I didn't know I was going to talk about the anointing this week. The Lord wouldn't leave me alone about it. So here's where where we are. We learned last week that the anointing means to smear, or it means to rub, or to pour. It's an oil. It's a, it's, a, it's a certain kind of oil made from crushed olives called olive oil. And it has certain spices that are in it and put together like the Lord told them to. And we learned last week that God, from the moment that he gave Moses the instruction to anoint Aaron to be the high priest, from that moment to this present moment, that everything that God will use He will use an anointing on that life. Everything, everything. God anointed, God told Moses, anoint Aaron to be the high priest. And he anointed him to be high priest. And then God, we see throughout that God said, anoint Saul. God said, now go down. I've rejected Saul because he's been a disobedient. Now go down to the house of Jesse and anoint the one that I show to you. So now here we are, fast forward into the New Testament. Jesus understood the significance of the anointing. He knew that everybody expected the anointing to be on God's chosen. And so Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has anointed me. He he has anointed me. And then we went through and we we talked about what he had anointed him to do. He had anointed him to preach the gospel to the poor. I don't know what might be. Immediately when we think about the poor, we think about money, monetary things. But bless their heart. They they, they, they don't have anything. that's, That's not what it can be, but not necessarily what he meant by the poor. Because Jesus said, the poor you have with you always. No, but what he knew was that people were going to be deficient in areas of their life. See, being poor is a deficiency. It might be deficient in money, but so many times what we have is we have people who are deficient in joy. 
People who are deficient in hope. People who are deficient in, in peace in their life. Hope in their life. Love in their life. And what the Bible says is Jesus is declaring right there that he has the, that, that, that the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. We know the gospel means the good news. The good news to those who are deficient in an area of their life. I want to, I want to say this to you this morning. Whatever area, and, and listen, we, we may not ever know. That might be between you and God. But whatever area in your life that you are sitting there this morning, I want you to know this, that God was so concerned about every area of our life, every situation of our life. I know a lot of times we think it's all about salvation. It is. The greatest thing that ever happened to us was salvation. But can I tell you something? So much more took place on the cross at the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. No, he's, he, he covers it all right here. He's telling us that his anointing covers everything that we need in this life. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. He has anointed to preach the good news to those who are poor. They are deficient in an area. He has sent me to, watch this, to heal the brokenhearted. Brokenhearted. I thought, well, that's appropriate for this week of Valentine. Brokenhearted. Because here's what, listen, here's what being broken when you start talking about brokenhearted well you know what you know what is surprising surprising to find out that your heart can be broken yeah i mean it really can be broken and most of the time the referral of a broken heart is in a relationship pastor my heart is broken because i thought that he would never do me the way he done me. My heart is broken because I never saw what she did coming. And my heart is broken. My heart is broken because I thought we had a long time together, but they died. My heart is broken. And so what I'm saying to you this morning is, is that Praise and glory be to God. There is an anointing for the brokenhearted. He came to preach the good news to those who are brokenhearted. The good news to those who have been let down in, the, in, in that brokenhearted state. Watch what he says. He says he came to proclaim deliverance to the captive. Woo! Where's my delivered people at? Now, now, you're in a place right now, and I'm going to say this, I don't mean no disrespect, but I don't care how you was raised. I'm going to say this. I'm going to look at the camera. I don't care how you was raised. I don't care how messed up it might be. I don't care how big of a drug house, how big the alcohol house was, how big those things are going on in life. I don't care what denomination you was raised in. I came to tell you today that God brings deliverance to those who are in bondage in their life, praise God. All over this room, we have got person after person who has been set free by the power of the name of Jesus because of the anointing. Am I right? Am I right? Because you know what I'm talking about. If you, if you are here this morning and you say, you know what, pastor, I don't know how I'm going to make it. I can't seem to get set free. Well, I can, I can connect you to two or three people that said the same thing, but God has set them free. Amen. Mm. He said to preach the recovering of the sight to the blind. Now, I don't know if there's any blind people in here. You might, you know, be blind. I don't know. Uh. But that would be very vague if it was just specifically for physical blindness. Wouldn't, it wouldn't minister to a whole lot of people. And it would be so good of Jesus just to, to pick them out. But he knew what he was doing. The recovering of sight. Sight has so much more to do. You know, there is a physical sight and there is a spiritual sight. 
So many times people, they don't have any spiritual sight at all. They can't see themselves beyond the point that they are right now. The recovering of sight to the blind, fresh vision to those. The recovering of sight to the blind. Watch this. To set it, li- I gotta go. To set at liberty them that are bruised. Them that are bruised. You know, in the physical sense, you can be bruised and nobody's know you're bruised. You know, because a bruise don't kill you. You can cover a bruise up. You, you can cover a bruise up. You know, a bruise can be anywhere and you put on enough clothes, you cover it up. And you know what? You put a smile on your face and go out the door and nobody has to know about your bruise. But, but can, I, can I tell you something? Just because nobody knows about it don't mean it's not there. And there's a lot of y'all sitting in here right now. Jesus is trying to minister to you because you done bumped into something in your life and it's bruised you in a way. And listen, here's, here's the thing about it. Nobody has to know about it. It never has to be revealed, but you carry it around all the time. And, it, and it's not a life-threatening thing. You can live with it, but are you going to have to live with it the rest of your life? No, I came to tell somebody that God is concerned even about your bruise. Mm-hmm. Okay, I, I got to go. Watch this. To set at liberty them that are bruised, and then it jumps down to verse 19 and it says, to preach the acceptable <laughs> special kind of year of the Lord. Did y'all know this is an acceptable year of the Lord? That right now, this year is going to be your year. I want to say this to you. The, the anointing of God is so very, very valuable in your life. I wrote a lot of stuff down. Don't I tell you, I was writing a lot of stuff down last night as the Lord gave it to me. Listen, what I, what I believe that God wants us to do is God wants us to begin to seek after the anointing of God. Did you know that the anointing of God has to be sought after in your life? But a lot of people are afraid of the anointing of God. They are. They are. You know why? Because some church folk have told them that people who claim to be anointed are weird. They're weird. And so we grow up thinking, well, if any of that stuff starts happening, they weird. You, if they start speaking in tongue, boy, that's the devil and they weird. No, no, no. No, the anointing is not weird. The anointing doesn't make you weird. The anointing makes you different. Am I right? The anointing has a capacity to make you different. I'm different because see, if you don't do what the world says to do, then you're weird. See, if you're, if you're not going to sleep around before you get married, then, then if you're not going to do that, you're weird. If you're not going to live together, y'all just keep looking straight ahead. If you're not going to live together for a while and try it out before you buy it. Don't even kick the tires, just drive. So y'all just keep looking right at me, all right? <laughs> you know, one of them emotional buys. I couldn't afford it. But I jumped in and started driving. Then you're weird. Y'all know what I'm saying? If, if you're not going to be a, a social drinker and you're going to say you're one of them, I just ain't going to participate in that, then you're weird. No, you're not weird. You're different. You're, not, you're, you're different because you got the call of God and the anointing on, of God on your life and God's got something bigger for your life and you know it's bigger for your life and you don't want to jeopardize the anointing because God done done something in your life that he snuck up on you and you didn't see it coming and God showed up and done a work in your life. See, so many times what we want to do though is we want to label people that they're they're, they're weird. No, no, they're not weird because the anointing is on their life. They are different. They are different. Say they're different. They're different. Look at your neighbor and say, you're different. You're different. What we find out is the anointing brings radical favor. Radical kind of favor. In some ways, in some ways, the anointing is a free gift. Because we all get a measure. 
that, that, that it, it's, a, it's a free gift in our life. But in a lot of ways, the anointing beyond that initial experience, there is a price that has to be paid for, I'm going to say it, the deeper things. Deep cries out to deep. You can stay just like you are for the rest of your life. But if you want the deeper things of God, you can always be a rock that is skipping like a stone across the water. Or you can be like the one that goes deep or deep cries out to deep. But I want to tell you that the anointing has a way of bringing brokenness in our life. Brokenness in our life. And I'm gonna believe, I believe this, that in a lot of ways, oh God, there has to be that brokenness. It's not optional. Because what the anointing becomes, it becomes a draw. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And it's a draw on your life. And the draw on our life is this, this, this urge to surrender. I'm going to show you something. I'll be back. I wasn't going to do this, but I'll be back. Wait, 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 wait. I got it, I got it, I got it. Hold on just a second. We good. Hold on a minute. Grab that side, Pastor Joey. Come on. You got it? Come on. Hold on just a minute. I dropped it on my toe. (laughs) Okay. All right. Hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. I thought it was going to fall. Y'all good? The anointing is a draw. Donna used this Wednesday night. I thought about it. She used it Wednesday night that the blessing of God We get under the umbrella of the blessing of God. And when we're under the umbrella of the blessing of God, I don't know, he he honors his word and allows his blessing to fall down on us. She used the scripture that says that he will hunt you down and overtake you. Woo! But so many people want the anointing and the blessing of God out here. I want to do my own thing. I know I was raised this way. And it's going to be this way because it's in me. And so I just got to be like this. You know, mama was like this. Daddy was like this. Everybody was like this. You know, they were cray cray. A mess. But if you want the anointing of God, you can't stay out here and be like your mama. If you want the anointing of God, you can't stay like your daddy. Because it's drawing you to a deeper level with him. And that's why God says, when you get there, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Y'all, y'all. I told, my, I told Don, I said, this shirt look all right? She said, yeah, it looks good. We got to church. I said, you sure this shirt looks? She said, yeah, just don't raise your hands. <laughs> I said, why didn't you tell me that before we left the house? <laughs> you know, people critique me, y'all. I got in here the other day with Pastor Josh. And we was walking around showing some things. He said, come and walk with me. 
So right here, we're walking across the stage right here. I said, what's up? He said, there's a few things you've been saying that you ought not say. <laughs> I said, what are you talking about, Josh? He said, well, you know, you've been, I don't even know. Y'all, Daryl has a derelict. <laughs> and I said, what I won't say. <laughs> and I told Josh, I said, I'll tell you what you can do, Josh. <laughs> Pastor Josh, Pastor. So I'm going to say this. If I say something, then you're like, I went to Newton County Comprehensive High School. <laughs> Graduated class of 1983. Should have been 1982, but I didn't make it. <laughs> Because my mama kept me back. Amen? <laughs> I done said way too much. My mama done like fell out over here. I remember when I, you know, when I didn't make it to the third grade. I said, what am I going to tell my friends? She said, just tell them your mama kept you back. I'm 58 years old and I still tell people my mama kept me back. <laughs> Lord, I need to hush. What we have to learn is we have to learn the power of cultivating the anointing in our life. I looked up that word cultivating. You know, cultivating is a word that farmers use. It's used in, in the agricultural area. It, it's an organic word. It's talking about, and there's, there was two meanings that I wrote down. To cultivate something means to prepare and to use. To prepare the soil and to use the soil. The, uh, the, the word cultivate means, another one, uh, definition was to acquire and develop. To acquire and develop. The anointing in your life, the anointing on your life, there is a measure of the anointing on your life that is free. But there is a measure that has to be acquired and developed in your life. There has to be the developing that goes on in your life. Now, I want to give you three things really quick that will block the anointing of God from off of your life. You ready? I'm going to do this really quick. Number one. The, 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 I believe, and listen, there's many things, but these three things is what the Lord laid on my heart. And I believe the most dire thing here is the spirit of pride. Because what pride is, is pride is disobedience. Disobedience. Pride says, I got this. I can do this on my own. Pride says, I got my stuff that I can always lean on. Some of you will get up and walk out of this room today without allowing God to do what God is saying he wants to do in your life. That's pride. Pride says, I got tomorrow. Pride says, you can always do it next week. Pride says, that wasn't God. Don't allow, and what, it, and what pride does is it calls us and causes us to be disobedient to God. So in an act of disobedience, some of you won't come and give your life to Jesus this morning. You will be prideful enough to walk out of this room and say, I'll do that another day. You'll be prideful enough to say, I got this drinking problem. Prideful enough to say, my marriage don't need it. All she needs, all he needs is this or that. That's pride. Pride is one of those things that will block you and keep you from the anointing of God. Second thing, I'm going to do it quick. Second thing, a crushed spirit I, listen, the longer I do ministry, the more people I meet that have crushed spirits. A crushed spirit is where someone, some mentor, some parent, 
Somebody in leadership has hurt you in a way. Some, some marriage situation, some man, some woman, that it has crushed your spirit to the place to where you don't feel like you are ever going to be able to receive anything from God. After all, the anointing of God on my life. I can never be anointed by God because I'm so stupid. I could never be anointed by God. After all, you know where I came from? Do you know how I was raised? No, what I do know is your spirit has been crushed. And you have bought a lie and you believed a lie. And know this, that the lie, that the Bible says that Satan is a liar. And that he is the father of all lies. Everything he will accomplish in your life, he will accomplish through a lie. So you believed a lie. And because of that, your spirit has been crushed. And you don't think you could ever measure up. You could ever be used by God to do anything. Third thing, you ready? Last one. Unforgiveness, you knew that one was coming. Because of what she done, because of what he done, because of what that leader done, because of this. And I'm gonna tell you something, my spirit's not only crushed, but I will never forgive them for what they have done. And that's my way of getting them back. And I don't have anything peaceable to say about them. I don't have anything. I'm going to, I'll never do anything for them. I will never ever. And you don't realize that the whole time, though it's been 20 years, they still got you by the throat. Because they have affected your life and they are robbing the anointing of God from off of your life. What you don't realize is that releasing them and surrendering them draws us like the woman with the alabaster box. We too have to be broken so that the anointing can pour out. But the problem with our society today is we don't want to let go. We don't want to let go. And because we don't want to let go, we can't get close to God and receive what he has for us. I'm challenging you right here in this moment. We read a story just a minute ago about a young man named David and his life. You, did, you, did you see it? Did, did you notice what it said? It said that Samuel went to the house of Jesse. And he saw Elab. Elab looked so much like Saul, the, form, the, the present king, that Samuel went right to him. Said, surely this is the one. He's tall. He's dark. He's handsome. Look at those shoulders. He's got kingly shoulders. He gets his horn of oil out. And God says, what are you doing? I've rejected him. And all seven of his sons. And they said to Jesse, Is I got one little boy. Where is he? No, oh, he's tending my sheep. Do you, do you know where David was? He was on the backside of a sheep field in the dark room being developed. The anointing being developed, writing songs and poems and, 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 and taking care of the business that his father and doing it faithfully. And Samuel says, go get him. We won't sit down until he gets here. Did you, did you notice something though? That Samuel, the high priest, the priest, didn't see the anointing on David. Jesse, his father, didn't see the anointing on David. All his brothers, all seven of them, didn't see the anointing. Can I tell you something? Not everybody is going to see the anointing on your life. But what you do is you understand 
that you're in that dark room being developed. Wherever it is that God has placed you, you got to go after the anointing of God. Oh, you, you, got, you got some free stuff, but at the same time, if you want, there's a price to be paid, and the price that is paid has to be brokenness. Did you know that brokenness is a prerequisite to the anointing of God on our life? Think about it. Every great man that was used by God. Moses. He was 80 years old when the burning bush took place. And the burning bush was, he was at his all-time low of brokenness in his life. And God used him. Moses. Now think about Abraham. Abraham, he wanted a son so bad. And God says, I'm going to give you a son. They laughed. (laughs) They laughed. Him and his wife, because they was 100 years old. All of a sudden, she's like, you ain't going to believe this. (laughs) She had a son. When the son got to a certain age, God speaks to Abraham and says, take your only son. Up on a place where I'm going to show you. What you want me to do, God? I want you to kill him. Offer him as a sacrifice. And you know what happened when he got to the place? He had the knife in it. There was such a brokenness. Think about Jacob. Jacob had been wanting, all Jacob wanted on his life was the blessing of God. He, he was called heel grabber. He came out of the womb holding on to his brother. He was a twin. Came out of the womb holding on to his brother Esau's heel. Trying to pull him back. Let me go first. Because the firstborn got the blessing of the father. So when he couldn't get it through birth, he goes and he tricks his father. When his father was old and couldn't see, he tricks him. And his brother Esau said, I'll kill you if I ever see you again. And he runs. And 20 years later, his brother finds out where he's at. And you know the story. That night, he sent all of his family over. He was still Jacob, deceiver. Still had that that title. And then all of a sudden, he has this broken wrestling match with the angel of the Lord to the point to where the angel wrestles with him. And at the end of the the wrestling match, the angel says, just to to show you who's who's the boss. The Bible says he touched him in his hip and knocked his hip out of socket. You, you know, you like, the, the rest of Jacob's life, he walked with a limp as a reminder. And he says, what is it that you want, fella? He said, I have always wanted the blessing of God on my life. And he said, well, what is your identity? What's your name? He said, well, my name is Deceiver. My name is whatever. And I don't know what you've been called. I don't know what your name is. My name is Drunk. My name is Drug Addict. My name is Adulterer. But God said to him, he said, no longer will you be called Jacob after this moment right here. From this moment right here, you will get up and you will go and you are going to be a mighty nation that is known as Israel. Jacob walked with a limp the rest of his life. But it cost him something. It cost him something. And I don't know where some of you are right now. But I just hear God calling you to a deeper level and the deeper level is going to take an anointing and the anointing is going to take brokenness and surrender to the things of God To be in the place where the blessing of God can cover your life and fill you with his goodness, meet you at the point of your need. I'm telling you, your daddy ain't a problem. 
What your mama done ain't the problem. No, 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 no. What, 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 is, what is your name? Is your name hurt? Is your name offended? Is your name unforgiver? What is your name? If you'll allow yourself to be drawn and broken and surrendered to the presence of God, the anointing of God will come on your life and he will raise you up. You might carry the scars of it for the rest of your life, but he will raise you up, put a testimony inside of your mouth, and you will never want to get out from under the anointing. You will cling to it and take it wherever you go in your life. The anointing of God will go with you wherever you go. Stand up on your feet. I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning. But I preached about half my message and I'm going to hush. Who am I talking to this morning? That you know, you know that God has called you. You know that the place where you're going, and right now you're in the dark room and it's broken and all is screaming is surrender, 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 surrender. So are you going to let one of those things block you? Or are you going to break through that and receive what God has for you? Bow your heads and close your eyes. Who am I talking to this morning? Who am I talking to this morning? Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you're in this room, the number one thing right now that's on the table is your salvation is that you get that free measure of the anointing on your life. Maybe you're one of those that says, you know what, there was a time, Pastor, when I had it, I knew, no, I had, what have I I've done? I've lived like hell. I've lived like I wanted to live. What I need to, you need to recommit your life. Or maybe you're one of those that says, you know what, I've never done it. I've never accepted Jesus. Today's your day. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If that's you, just throw your hand up and let me know I'm talking to you. One, two, hold it up high because I'm slow. Three, four, five. I said, man, what? All those hands. I'm ready to receive it, Pastor. Praise God. You can put your hand down. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you're one of those that says to me, Pastor Darrell, you know what? I'm, I know I'm saved, man. I know I'm good. I'm good, but Pastor, there's some brokenness going on and, there, and, it, and it's requiring some surrender in my life. And I'm having a tough time with it. And I need some prayer. If that's you, Slip your hand up. Hold your hand up real high all over the room, all over the room, all over the room. Thank you so much. I'm having you do that so you can identify. Ready? Put your hand down. All right. In just a moment, Pastor Jody and this team's going to sing a song. And when they sing that song, don't hesitate. Don't wait on that person beside you. Just step out. You're going to have no problem receiving what God has for you today. I'm telling you. Today, this is a house of breakthrough. God's going to do great things in your life. God's going, are you going to be prideful and you're just going to say, you know what, I, I'm just not going, I don't want, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to do that. Are you going to be that way and walk out? Are you going to surrender and let God do what only God can do? Come on. Isn't it time?